It's kind of funny. He's back there just going like this. She's upstairs. I'm just like, dang it, boy, you're 17 months old. He's, he's, he's probably overly stimulated still this morning. As Last night, you know, we had our open house at Ian's, and we're all kind of occupied talking to adults and whatnot, and Christians walking around more or less somewhat unsupervised, not, not in a dangerous situation, but a little bit unsupervised. Makes his way to the room with the sweets, and we've made these little pretzel things with the Rolos on them, right? You've all seen these at parties. So he had one in each hand and one in his mouth. And we're, we're unaware of really how many that he ate. And, and then after that, he found his way to the, to the table where the cookies were, and he could reach the chocolate chip cookies. Same thing, one in mouth, one, two, one in each hand. So again, we don't know how much chocolate was actually consumed on his part last night, but... Uh, He's probably rather happy still this morning. But uh, we'll roll along with our, with our story this morning. Um, if you and I, we, we plant bushes or trees that bear fruit, we do so with kind of a joyful expectation that at some point, those bushes and trees will actually bear fruit. We will get the fruit of our labors to be rather literalist this morning. We know that it takes time that raising these types of plants takes a lot of care, a lot of nurturing. It's not something that happens easily. You know, if you plant a fruit-bearing tree, you do so knowing that it's going to be three, maybe four, maybe five years before you get any fruit from that you do expect it to happen and you are excited and joyful and expectant that you will actually get fruit from your work. And then finally... Finally, the big day comes and the tree or the bush is, is hanging full of fruit and it's beautiful. I mean, it's the kind of fruit that makes your mouth water just by looking at it. And you think, yes, today's the day. I'm going to take these apples. I'm going to take these cherries and I'm going to make the most incredible diabetes causing dessert the world has ever known. You pick the fruit. You go into your kitchen. You begin the preparations. And then comes the disappointment. As piece after piece after piece turns out to be rotten. Filthy on the inside. But beautiful on the outside. And I tell you that story because that's exactly where Israel finds itself in history today as John the Baptist is preaching this message. You see, God had taken Israel and pulled her out of exile into Egypt and planted her in the land. And then as she went through all the tumults and tortures of her life and then she goes into exile again, he brings her back and plants her firmly again in the land, expecting this time, this time for his people to bear fruit, yet the only fruit that is bore is rotten on the inside while beautiful on the outside. And then on that scene comes John the Baptist, another special person sent from God to tend this garden of Israel, to tend after this vineyard, to see to it that finally, maybe now, she can bear fruit even though they're past the point of maturity. So God had sent John to prepare the way of the coming Messiah to lay level the paths that the people would need to walk to have their hearts ready for Jesus when he appeared on the scene. He's there to soften the hearts so that they can bear fruit worthy of repentance. And this story is important for us because this story, unfortunately, never changes. God, in many ways, is still waiting on us to bear fruit worthy of repentance. So let's, let's walk through this passage this morning 
and see if we can see what it is that God is calling us to do, what it is that He's calling us to be. And we're going to do this by looking at John's warning to the people, looking at his examples of good fruit, and looking at the very call of the gospel as proclaimed by John. So you can take your Bibles and uh, look in Luke 3, 7 through... um, Um, 17, excuse me, 7 through 17 as we decide and see what God is showing us this morning. Now, John the Baptist is by far one of my favorite characters in the Bible. You know, he's described as a crazy man wearing hairy clothes, eating locusts and wild honey. And as a child, I thought that meant he was eating bugs because in that part of the world, they do eat bugs. But in actuality, a locust is more than likely another type of plant. But nevertheless, John is an unusual person. He's not run of the mill. He's the kind of figure that makes other people uncomfortable. And I I, I often think back, and I I shared this in the early service this morning, that, that John the Baptist reminds me of two people that I knew and met in seminary. One was a man named Jim Gillespie, and the other one was a man named Lee Jeffries, both of which were bikers, not in the sense of riding a little tiny bike with small tires like I ride, but riding a Harley Davidson. And both of them had actually started biker churches, and and Jim, for, for his sake, had actually been in a how should we call it, a illegal motorcycle gang at one point, and the Lord had radically touched him. But nevertheless, these guys still looked the part. I mean, tattoos on their fingers, spider webs tattooed on here, eye drops, whatnot. I mean, the whole nine. I mean, these are, these are rough and gruff looking guys. In fact, first time Shannon ever called up to the seminary to report something wrong with our electrical system in our house, they send Jim down there. He knocks on the door. He's got this gruff voice, and he's like, maintenance. Shannon's like, no, you're not coming in the house. And the same said for Lee Jeffries at a ponytail this long. They're the kind of guys that make other normal little seminary boys uncomfortable. They don't really know how to act. They get kind of squirmish. In fact, you know, going to Lee's church, Open Road Church, was a very unique experience. It's the only place I've ever been to where there's actually a gun check at the door when you walk in. So if you can imagine that, just imagine that amplified 10 or 20 times, I think you have an idea of what... John the Baptist may have been like. In a world full of everybody being prim and proper, here's a guy walking around in loincloths and eating honey from a wild bush. I mean, this is a, a very, very unique individual. And, you know, he didn't preach like everybody else either. I mean, the basic preaching of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and any other group of the day was this. Your problem is you're not like me. If you'll just be like me, then everything else in your life is going to be fine. If you'll just live the way I live, follow the law the way I follow the law, everything's going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be perfect. It'll come up roses for you. That's not John's message at all. John's message is, first of all, you stinking snake. Who told you to repent? And second of all, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was very different. He was a living reminder that all of their best efforts to obey the law and all of their best efforts to earn God's favor were ultimately fruitless. Because here's John telling them all, you need to repent. You need to entirely change your orientation to the world, which is what repentance means. You need to entirely change your outlook if you think you're going to be in the kingdom of God just because by virtue of your birth. So he begins, you know, this this sermon with you brood of vipers. And I dare say that on that day, John made no new friends. But the point was that many people that came around John didn't think they needed to repent, which is why he preached this so hard. They actually believed that by virtue of their birth, by the fact that they were born Jews, that they were on God's side, or to say it even better, they felt like God was on their side. And that they were not in need of any genuine heart change. Just their virtue of their birth would be all they needed. And John quickly warns them, friends, that's never going to be enough because God can raise up ancestors and descendants from these rocks. He doesn't need your special birth. He warns them that they cannot rely on their national origin to be enough for a right standing with God. No. John had a harder warning for the people than that. 
John warns the people to repent and to have behavior that reflects that repentance. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. He warns them by reaching out to the very deepest desire of their heart. You see, all the people were pregnant with expectation at this time that the kingdom of God would come, that God would do something to set Israel free at this time. This was the hope of the people. So John's piggybacking on their expectations, piggybacking on what is happening, pulling them into it by saying, repent, repent. The kingdom you're looking for, it's, it's right around the corner. And you and I often misunderstand this warning because we misunderstand the picture that John uses here. We often take this idea of the axe being at the root of the tree and we imagine some lumberjack figure standing there in the yard, putting the gloves on, he's got the axe, the tree's still standing, maybe he's sharpening the axe, he's got a file on it. But that's really not what John's saying at all. It's not that the guy is getting ready to cut down the tree, but rather picture it like this. Rather than an axe, I actually think of a, a machete is a better picture here. And you've got this guy not tending a great big tree, but a pretty substantial bush. And the way they would go about doing this is wrap their arm around it, lean it over, and hit it as close to the ground as they could, trying to expose that very last link to the ground, that tap root. And so what he is saying here when he says that the axe is already at the root of the tree is John has painted a picture of a person that has pulled this tree almost completely out of the ground and has got his hand back on the last strike necessary to pull this bush from the ground and it's immediately going into the fire. It's useless. This is the warning. This is how close the kingdom of God is in John's mind. It is an immediate threat, so to speak. It is on the verge of entering into our world. It's that kind of expectation that John is writing and, and putting in the people's ears. This is what he's saying, which is why people say, Okay, what must I do? If the kingdom is that close, if at any moment God is actually going to step in and launch the kingdom, what do I have to do? He's wanting to have them bear fruit, wanting them to get out there and actually have a changed heart. And what's really unique is that people are even willing to hear this message from John. They're willing to have their hearts changed, so to speak. They want to bear these fruits of the kingdom. And what exactly are the fruits of the kingdom? What exactly does John urge his people to do in response to this call to baptism? Does he give them strict new guidelines for their diet? No. The people can go to the Pharisees for that if they want to learn how to wash bowls and wash hands. That's the place to go for that information. Does he give them strict new rules for interacting with the outside world? No, he doesn't. You can go to the Essenes to find out how to mistreat other people just because they're not like you. They don't need any more of that. No, rather he gives them a very simple message that, friends, is entirely full of the gospel. Look at what he asks them to do here. One, he tells them, if you've got two coats... You need to be willing to share one with someone who doesn't have one. And the same thing you have to be willing to do with your food. If you have food and your neighbor doesn't, be willing to share food with your neighbor. And basically what he's saying, you cannot ignore the plight of your fellow men, especially when it comes to basic human needs. Food, clothing, shelter, those things that make life livable. You can't ignore the plight of your fellow human being. But he's actually saying more than that. Why is he saying that? Just because it's a good thing to do? Because we should take care of our neighbors just to make ourselves feel better? That's not what John's getting out at all. He's asking his people to live out. Asking them to live in such a way that the original intentions for God's world are actually made manifest. He's telling them to live out God's shalom, His peace, His intention for the world. To live as God always wanted humanity to live because that's what the kingdom is. The kingdom is the world set the way God wants it to be. There's no secret to the kingdom to its content. And that's what it is. The kingdom is the world set back to God's standards. The easiest definition of the kingdom that we can come up with. And this is why he goes on to give two very specific examples that were very pertinent and very in the faces of the people in the ancient world. He talks about tax collectors and soldiers. 
Now, in the ancient world, as in today's world, nobody likes the tax man. It's simply a profession that does not garner you any friends. I can't think of meeting someone and them actually telling me, well, I'm an RS agent. I can't imagine that actually. They would come up with something else besides, well, I, I work in government. That would, that would be the phrase. Nobody would actually, I think, say, I am the tax man. You know, it's just not something that's going to make you want to be friendly with something, with someone. And you think about it, the IRS for us, for you and I, is mainly a nameless and faceless bureaucracy. I mean, you just don't ever really see anybody. You don't ever really know anybody from it. You don't have to interact with it, hopefully, ever. I don't hope you get one of those letters in the mail. Um, but it's just out there. It's, it's, for us, it's not anything we know personally. In the ancient world, it's all that ten times worse because the tax collector is somebody you know. He's somebody in that town, in that region. In fact, it's probably somebody of long-standing living in that region so he can know everybody, have an idea about who they are, what family they come from, what their holdings are, and all of that so that he has an idea of what he should really be getting from them when it comes time to pay taxes. So you can imagine, this is someone that has, in a way, turned his back on the people, right? Right? He's not standing with them. He's standing over and against them and collecting taxes. Now, let's add insult to injury and the fact that now Israel is under occupied forces. So this person is not only gathering taxes, but gathering taxes for a foreign power operating on their soil, giving it back to Rome. So on top of being a tax collector, this person is more or less going to be viewed by most people as what? A traitor. A traitor to Israel. So this is the kind of person that is responding to this call to the kingdom. And what does John tell them? What does he tell them to do? Don't fleece the people. Which is what these guys would often do to make themselves wealthy. Since they didn't have any chance of having friends and family, they would just skim off the top of the taxes from the people. Constantly fleecing them. John tells them, don't do that. Only collect what you are supposed to. But notice what John doesn't tell them. What does John not tell them? Stop being a tax collector. He doesn't tell them, quit your job. He doesn't tell them, overflow, overthrow Rome by force. Rise up and kill your oppressor. None of that is said by John. None of that. Rather, do your job honestly. Do your job with the right heart. That is what is told to them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. And the same thing can go for soldiers who in the ancient world, the lowest ranking soldier in the world had the right to extort and conscript common people sort of at the drop of a hat. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, if someone compels you to walk a mile with them, go a second. Do you know what that's about? That's really a interaction with the Roman soldier who at the drop of a hat could conscript you to carry his gear for one mile. If he was simply just tired, tired of marching and carrying everything he had to carry, he could pull someone out of a crowd and say, you stand here in my line and you carry my stuff for the next mile. And Jesus says, if you are told to do that for a mile, go a second. And many times these soldiers would do that right outside of the city so that they could walk somebody a mile outside of the city and then <laughs> rob them blind. And so in John's word to soldiers is what? Not to stop being a soldier. Not to stop serving in the army, but to listen, live your life honestly. Don't extort people. Don't do that. And be happy with your wages. You know, soldiers then as now sometimes are vastly underpaid. And in the ancient world, they would sometimes be paid in spices and actual tradable goods. One of the favorite ways to be paid was was salt. Because salt was a, a, a fantastic commodity in the ancient world. And you could then, t in turn, sell it in the marketplace at a far greater rate than you would have gotten wages. It's all great when the salt they actually pay you with is good. But more often than not, what would happen with the soldiers is they would have a little bit of good salt at the top of their wage bag. And the rest of it would just be bad salt in the bottom of that bag. And they were paid by weight. And so they would get their wages undercut. John's warning to them is, be happy with your wages. Don't extort people. 
Don't mistreat people. This is the warning that comes from John. This is the fruit of the kingdom. And it's not just be good for the sake of being good. It's be good because your heart has been changed and because you're a different people. You know, John's message for you and I, it, it doesn't sound like good news, does it? Does this sound happy? I mean, essentially, within this short little sermon we have from John, he's twice told everybody they're going to get tore up and burned up in, in hellfire. They're either a bush getting thrown in the fire or they're the wrong side of the winnowing fork. That this moment of cataclysmic judgment is coming. And that's what that expectation of the kingdom, that coming of the kingdom was always tied to this moment of judgment where God judges the world. And so... You think about it. This is hellfire and brimstone preaching in the literal sense. And how do the people respond to it? And then Luke Luke goes on to say, And with that and many other proclamations, John manifested the good news. So even though it doesn't sound like good news necessarily to you and I, it actually is. It actually was good news. And even though the passage is difficult for us, and even though the, the good news is unexpected, It doesn't feel like the gospel. It it feels like the law. It feels like something imposing upon us. But John is said to have gone around preaching the gospel. That is the arrival of the kingdom. Now John's also very clear that he's not the one that's actually bringing this kingdom, is he? In the scheme of things, he knows that his own work is temporal and fading, while the one that comes after him will have work that is permanent and it will consist of a baptism by fire and the Holy Ghost. And this is not a throwaway line. I think this is actually this line that makes John's message good news, friends. This baptism by fire, usually indicating a trial or a testing, and the Holy Spirit, this promise, is it's nothing less than the promise of a heart-changing new covenant. Because you see, John is the last in the line of those great prophets. Those Old Testament prophets sent from God to get the people ready. And he realizes in his own work that he is at that moment that Jeremiah has written about. That moment of a new covenant coming where God is going to transform hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And John knows that's what he's proclaiming. That message of repentance, that message of the kingdom is that. And we know that because it's it's necessary to have that heart change to be a new people. Because see, this new kingdom requires new citizens. And this kingdom has a certain level of citizenship expectation. And it's only possible through the power of a transformed heart. Through God renewing the covenant himself. And without that piece of information, friends, it would be easy for this passage not to be good news for us. We would look at it as simply another call to better ourselves by tightening up our belt of morality. By coming over one more hole and saying, "Mm, I'm going to do better. Mm, I'm not going to do that. Mm, I'm going to do this instead. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, so to speak. But John knows that's not enough. More effort on our part is not enough. Because, see, you know, John's living here in the period of the second temple. In the period of the first temple, Solomon's temple, Israel's great medicine was idolatry. She constantly fell into idolatry and constantly was not doing what God had outlined and was not living the way God had called her to live in the world. But by the time you go through the exile and the people come back in the period of the second temple, the temple that we're now talking about when John is alive, Israel's great meta-sin is the exact opposite. It's no longer is she idolatrous. She's prideful in her own ability to follow the law. Prideful in her own power. Prideful that she is unlike everyone else. She is finally pure. She is finally not like the world. And therefore totally missed God's call to be a light for the nations. This is what John is preaching up against. So however we look at John's message, we can't view it as a call to simply do better by our own moral superiority. No, he knows the new kingdom will require new people with new hearts. His advent message is the kingdom is coming and that the king himself will do all that is necessary to make the people ready for the kingdom. That's what made John's message good news. And that's what continues to make John's message good news.
Now, many of you may be thinking, okay, Donnie, why is this so important? And what in the world does it have to do with Advent 2015? Well, to state it very simply, John's message is still good news. And we still need to hear it. Friends, look, there are many people out there who do not know Christ, but they strive to do right by their fellow man. They have a moral conscience, and yet they simply cannot do what they want to do because they haven't had the power of a transformed life. They don't have the empowerment that comes through a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. And friends, it doesn't end for people outside of Christ. It goes for us as well. We never outgrow our need for the gospel, our need for that proclamation to ourselves, that empowerment that comes from His Holy Spirit. We are never at a time when we no longer need that. We need that constant filling from Him so that we can do all that He wants us to do. Or better yet, we can be all that He wants us to be. As a matter of fact, it applies all the more to us because we stand on this side of Christ's completed work. We're not waiting for the coming of the kingdom. Jesus and John the Baptist proclaimed the coming of the kingdom. The apostles and the church after them proclaim the kingdom has come. The kingdom has come. Oh, come worship the king. It's not that we're waiting on the kingdom to come. It's that we proclaim the kingdom has come in Christ and in His church. It is made present in the world. Come into the gates of the kingdom. Come into the people of God. You and I live on the other side of that Advent expectation. The first Advent is behind us.